So yes, the title, Three Gates, Three Great, great Gateways to Liberation. Um, so a good place to start is to talk about something we perhaps don't talk about all that often, and that's Nirvana. The Three Gateways to Liberation, the Three Gateways to Nirvana, and then a little bit later I'll explain why I've used this phrase, when all is in flames. Um, state of nirvana the place of perfect peace and perfect happiness so it was always thought that it was impossible to depict nirvana in any way and i was quite surprised to come across um, some material where artists had actually set out to do just that to depict nirvana um, in particular, uh, a rather delightful book, um, Picture Books of the Three Worlds, um, comes from Thailand. And so sometimes the attempts to depict the Nirvana were just to draw or leave an empty space on the painting, on the picture. But other, other manuscripts and other uh, sources have tried to depict this by drawing a complex city of Nirvana. And I felt this was a useful place to explore what these gateways are, because one thing very common with any depiction of cities, and the Buddha used the image of the city in many different ways in different teachings, some of which you'll be familiar with, possibly the most well-known one is in the Dhammapada. But one of the things with the city, and particularly the fortified city, is the, um, the, the, the city lies at the end of a straight path. And that path it represents or is the, the embodiment of the eightfold path. So we have an account. I'm going to read a few um, quotes at the beginning just to kind of uh, get a sense of what what the what this city of Nirvana um, is about. Um, so I'm going to read an, a, a short account from a, a sutta, the Nagara Sutta. There's two Nagara Suttas. This one's the Nagara Sutta about the city. Suppose because a man wandering through a forest would see an ancient path, an ancient road traveled upon by people in the past. He would follow it and would see an ancient city, an ancient capital that had been inhabited by people in the past with parks, groves, ponds, ramparts, a delightful place. So too bhikkhus, I saw the ancient path traveled by the Buddha of the past. And what is this ancient path, that ancient road? It is just this noble eightfold path. Um, so the single straight path, I'd like us to try and hold that thought in mind that what we're exploring here is an expression of the Eightfold Path, because some cities have more than one gateway. Um, some, some cities that are described in the, in the Buddha's teachings, for example, will have six gateways representing the six sense doors, sense gates. Um, but this sense of a straight path to the city as a distinctive feature of this attempt to describe Nibbana and thereby to give some significance to the gateways to liberation, the gateways to Nibbana. And then the second part of the title about all is in flames, there are a number of things that, um, that struck me about that. Um, I, I came across a book actually a book in the library lying around that I hadn't noticed before called The Flavour of Liberation. I thought this is obviously useful to have a look at um, before giving this talk and it was quite interesting. 
uh, people come to learn meditation because they're seeking some kind of peace from mental affliction of one kind or mental distraction of one kind or another. Or they come to meditation for some kind of understanding of life or they're seeking some kind of healing. But in all this, we start with no real reference point that knows peace or doesn't fully understand what peace is. Now, the next paragraph I thought was very striking. So we investigate the four elements. We investigate how our mind might be working. Where does this idea of me come from? How I might go, how I might let it go? What might this letting go actually be? We try to understand the law of dependent, duration, dependent origination, thinking, yes, I'm just a conditioned process and my suffering is because I'm clinging to this conditioned process and all I've got to do is to let go of my clinging. This is the sort of way mind works. Where's the peace? Hmm. This is the writing of a, a, of a man called Bergs, um, a kind of uh, self... Um, part of a tradition that I think he, he developed and set up of his own. Um, and all the way through the way I read that and what I hope you heard was something of that almost as though we're on fire. We're trying to put the fire out and as soon as we get close to putting the fire out one place it's burning somewhere else and so on and so forth. And he then goes on to say after five or six pages of this, all at this same frantic kind of pace, he then finally says, and the one taste, the one flavor of Dharma, and the very liberation from all ideas and sense of ex and experience of self. It is this notion of self that separates us from the experience of boundless love, boundless compassion. He uses the word appreciation, um, joy, and happiness in the joy and happiness and appreciation of others that, that is waiting to be revealed in the heart of all of us once we're finally willing to let go of our attachment to our ideas of ourselves. How wonderful! And that's the end of the book. <laughs> I think very clear message, but it doesn't quite ring true or ring bells in the sense of this is what I've come to know and what we've come to know through practice in the way we do. Um, other references and the, particularly the all is in flames um, come from the, uh, the fire sermon, the chant of the fire sermon which is an extraordinary piece of chanting if you've not uh, witnessed it but in that the Buddha is declaring that each of the six senses, each of their objects, the corresponding consciousness and feelings are all on fire, on fire with greed, hate and delusion, on fire with birth, old age and death. Um, of course, death is often uh, described as the extinction of the flame with sorrows, lamentations, suffering, miseries, and despairs. Um, so, reading that, I thought, well, how do we, how might the city of Nirvana present a, a different approach, uh, a different description? Um, and just got me to, to, to think about, well, why, and how is the image of the fortified city used uh, by the Buddha? And there seems to be a number of different ways. One is the way I want to focus on uh, the city as Nirvana entered through a gate uh, of which the gate or the door to the gate is opened upon uh, experiencing a particular level of development or sufficient development. That's one way that the teaching, that the city is used and it, it, its imagery is used. In the Dhammapada, the city is used more as a symbol of the body. So the city is a body needing protecting, needing guarding, and um, not, not guarding both the body 
and mind. And then the city as Dhamma, where um, the different features of the city correspond to. There's one particularly interesting list where the seven defensive requisites of a city correspond to the seven qualities of a practitioner. A little bit along the lines of the seven bodhi, uh, the seven factors of enlightenment as, as, as we practice them in our tradition. But this picture book of the three worlds, and when I read these, um, these suggestions out, I'd like you just to try and hold an image of this fortified city in, in the mind and just let these kind of thoughts, mull these thoughts over. Um, and just to suggest that these perhaps embody how our practice or our tradition of practice, the breadth of our tradition of practice, the different ways we might um, pursue. So there's different elements of teachings here symbolized in the fortified city. So the five precepts or the eight precepts or the ten precepts are the walls, five stories, eight stories, ten stories high. Um, wisdom or wisdom that enables uh, us a, a transcendent kind of wisdom. Um, the fourth of the uh, of the param parami, uh, the perfections, is the half opened town gate or city gate. Um, the method of conditional relations is the stockade. The stockade is the thing that built is built to kind of confine and, uh, and, and hold in place animals and, and, and humans and so on and so forth. The method of conditional relation, showing how all things are interconnected and tied together and how things um, <clears throat> affect each other. The four immeasurables, loving kindness, compassion, um, joy in the joy of others and equanimity are the four moats around the city. The 24 conditions, um, part of the Patana teaching, the conditions that set about how all things come, uh, come together, come about, are the 24 main roads through the city. The 37 sets of qualities that are needed to reach enlightenment, the Bodhi Pakyadamas, are the 37 markets. Busy activity, lots going on. The seven books of the Abhidhamma form the seven story palace. Knowledge of release is the throne in that palace. Renunciation is the sleeping place on the floor. Wisdom is the candle giving light in that room. Generosity, virtue, renunciation, wisdom, equanimity, patience, persistence, truth, determination, and goodwill, the ten perfections, are the jewel mosaic on the floor. Various types of bhavana, cultivation, ways in which we cultivate and develop practice, is the pond. Karuna, or maha karuna, great compassion, is the cool water. And the arahats who have escaped all evil deeds are the types of bees who suck honey. Arahats who have successfully abandoned all blemishes and sinfulness are the peacocks, cranes, ducks, swans, who sing beautifully. And that's one particular formulation or description associating qualities or practices with what's embodied in this fortified city. Some of you know the Mahasudasana Sutta where some similar um, the, the, the last part with the 10 different types of crying and sounds and so on um, 
for example, is, uh, is there. So I thought it might be nice to have a short time together doing a little bit of visualization of this or, or of the city, if you're uh, open to this, just to, um, not, not a particularly long period of time, but just to um, get a feel for what this kind of uh, imagery symbolism is used for, can be used for, and to see how that may embed qualities into the Samatha or the Samatha Vipassana practice, particularly the Samatha part of the practice. Um, so can I suggest we um, sit comfortably? Um, we don't have to sit on the floor for this, I don't think. Uh, you, you can if you will. It's not going to be a particularly long practice, but, uh, but just to do some visualization together to make some kind of connection with this material around the city of Nirvana. I'd like you first just to let the breath go quiet and settle and settle to some degree of stillness. And as a group, we're going to set off and go to uh, the city, city of Nirvana, we're going to visit the city of Nirvana and just get a taste and glimpse of whatever comes up in our mind, maybe in visual form, maybe more a feeling. But in order to um, set off on the journey, I'd like you to imagine you're handed an object to take with you. The object comprises the four great elements earth, water, fire, and air, in some way, some way um, embodies those. And from our point of view, they represent counting, following, touching, and settling. Now with this kind of visualization, we can just simply say, go to the city and just take ourselves directly there. So go to the city, passing through a partly opened gate. And just note the qualities of the gateway. You'll have passed over at least one of the moats representing the immeasurables. And as you enter into the city, all around are buildings of gold, silver, beryl, crystal, agate, coral, and all kinds of gems. So just try to get to feel what it's like being in a place with buildings from those materials. And we're heading through the village, sorry, through the city, 
to the jewel mosaic on the floor. So if we gather by the jewel mosaic and try to notice, observe what kind of qualities there are in us in response to what we see. And then we move away from the mosaic and go to sit quietly by the pond, the pond representing different types of bhavana cultivation. And we'll spend a couple of minutes practicing in whatever way you wish while sitting quietly by the pond. start to bring your practice to an end and return to your room wherever you are becoming aware of contact with the ground contact with the chair and being present back in the body fully back in the body Good. Now, it would be a bit tricky if I asked you all for your comments. And some of what you'll have experienced um, may well be quite personal. Um, and some of what you'll have experienced may well, in a discussion kind of context, might well enable any one of those teachings or any other teaching to become that little bit more based in direct experience. So I want to spend another 15 minutes or so just introducing some of what's described. It's not a very easy material, 
on the three gateways as described in the, um, the teachings. In particular, I'm drawing from a book called The Path of Discrimination. So there's three gateways, and I'd like you to try to um, consider these in relation to that Samatha kind of experience that you may have had in the city, just to hold that sense of the city in the back of your mind. So three different gateways to liberation leading to freedom from the world. One of them is uh, that we see all conditioned things as limited, restricted, um, and that our knowledge and awareness of that points us towards the signless gateway, the signless gateway. So the signless gateway has no signs, no forms. We can't, um, there's no particular characteristic or attribute, it's signless. It's beyond our normal conceptual thought. And for me, I remember an occasion, I have a feeling Ian Rose was around at the time, oh, years and years ago, he took us into a, a cave, a group of us, into a really, really dark cave. I mean, not just, you know, grey, but absolutely dark. We were in the cave and uh, had no idea, no sign of any form. And he asked us to move, move around in that cave. There were a group of us, not just one of us on our own, but a group of us. And yes, you could sense others. That wasn't too difficult. But sensing where the walls and stone and rock were, were very, very interesting. I found myself, I still remember it really vividly, about a fraction of an inch in front of a rock and not knowing it was there. So that's, that's a good sort of way into the signless, for me. That was a, a useful kind of, no clues, no signs, nothing to provide, nothing to provide any kind of light. Um, as as that, that's what the quality of signlessness, um, the word translates from a nimitta, so the without nimitta. Um, so some may recognize that in, in relation to formless meditation practice. Um, the second of the gates is called the desireless or wishless or aimless gateway. And we know um, just what uh, heart craving plays in understanding of the, the noble truths, that uh, second noble truth, um, and in particular, the craving for sensual pleasures, the craving for existence, and the craving for non-existence uh, are, are given as a pretty comprehensive kind of set of where our desires arise from. So the second way, the second gateway, is through a state without desire, free from desire. Um, un and, and, and the way it's described is rather than the seeing of all formations, the stirring of the heart and mind with respect to all formations when we see that as limited and restricted, that takes that opens us to the awareness and the knowledge of the desireless principle. So it, it, that there's a sense there because we're talking about desire and, and, and feeling of something much more in an emo, of an emotional kind of quality, at least initially. But the gateway, the gateway is there through desireless 
ness. Desireless ness. That's right. Yeah. Um, one of the uh, authors, uh, Walt, Walt Polo Rahula, some of you may know, uh, when looking, when describing um, tanha, um, craving, the desire, craving, includes desires for an attachment to ideas and ideals, views, opinions, theories, conceptions, and beliefs. Well, that's fairly, <laughs> fairly all encompassing, isn't it? And of course, we know how much we invest in all those and how useful they are too and how we need to put them down and the third of the gateways um voidness or emptiness um starts with the statement the seeing of all ideas as alien and to the entering into awareness and knowledge of the void principle. So the alien um, is a very strong word really for the, for the nature of ideas. Well, I like ideas, you know, I enjoy ideas. I like to have 25 ideas before breakfast, you know. Um, but of course, how often do our ideas actually manifest in the way we first had the idea? Sometimes with some closeness, sometimes a long way away. Um, so the seeing of such is, is the awareness and knowledge of the voidness principle. And um, going back to the earlier um, the Pasana kind of passage I read, read out or quoted from, going from I to a stronger sense of ourself, and in many ways, um, confidence builds a stronger sense of who we are. On to no self is a very um, central part of the practice of the path for us individually. And then each of these three gateways through working with the insights into Anicca, Dukkha and Anatta, then are given a, a quite um, grand titles so the first, through working through impermanence, um, through the signless, leads to the great gate, so you could call the great gate of resolution or the great gate of faith. Um, and here, this I think I hope makes very clear that the, the use of the word faith here is quite different from what was talked about earlier is belief. Um, so one of the night, one of the phrases I like the best that um, that, that tells says something to me about faith. Faith is this is from T Tagore. Faith is the bird that sings to the dawn while it's still dark. Or the biblical one, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of the reality of things not yet seen. Um, and so it's quite clear that the great gate of faith um, is nothing cognitive about it. That being able to um, develop and step into and through that gateway um, is very much um, a sense of liberation by faith. Um, the second, the one that was um, concerned with the desireless um, and dukkha, 
giving our attention to pain and dukkha and developing um, to, uh, to work with and work through the pain, developing tranquility leads to the great gate of concentration. Um, and in our, uh, in our breathing practice, I think it's very obvious that a lot of the time we're working with the breath in an un initially with a breath in an unsatisfactory way and trying to um, transform that into uh, a calmer kind of breath. Um, when he gives attention to dukkha and he develops concentration, the great gate of concentration, and here's an interesting phrase, he is a, he is a body witness. And needless to say, when I first saw this, I was not at all sure of what was being referred to here, a body witness. Body witness is the translation of kaya saki. Kaya means body or, or the general accumulation, collection, grouping of things. And saki is seeing with your own eyes or an, a, an eyewitness when you say somebody is an eyewitness. Um, so it is literally um, somebody who has realized and gained some benefit concerning the body. And it makes sense to me why um, the Borankamatana, the old ancient traditions, um, pay this emphasis, which we, we pay, pay to, to the importance of the body as part of the practice. So we're not just dealing with the head and heart, we're dealing with the, with the body. Um, um, and so much so that in some of the Boran Kamatana practices, um, the, the instructions are very clearly about developing a subtler body, or sometimes called um, a, a phrase that we don't use too much, but maybe we know something of, developing a Buddha body. And um, certainly those people who've done the 32 marks of the Buddha practice know that we're working with within that kind of that kind of area. And then the great, the third gate, the great gate of wisdom. Um, and I was reminded of uh, Rudyard Kipling, of uh, two of his um, poems. Rudyard Kipling, you might think, oh, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's from the West, he's not, not relevant to this, but um, Rudyard Kipling brought more words into the English language than anybody else, that's well established, but I also think he brought more Buddhism to the West than anybody else. Um, this is a disputed um, scholarly issue that I've read about, but it's quite an interesting one. Anyway, one of his great poems, when I was a king and a mason, it's called. When he was a king and a mason, he set out to build a palace. And as he was building the palace, he came on the came upon, came across the wreck of an older palace. As he was digging in the foundations, he found an older palace. And he began to understand the form of the dream that the earlier builder had had and had followed. So he built reusing what he called the gifts of the humble dead. And then he says, they sent me a word from the darkness. The end is forbidden. Thy use is fulfilled. So it's as though he's, he's seeing that in the building, um, he can't claim that he's completed it. He can't himself, uh, his, his sense of self can't claim to have completed it. His use has been fulfilled. And so Kipling then says in the last line, so he cut on the timber, he cut out on the timber the phrase, after me 
cometh the builder, tell him I too have known. Quite interesting. Yeah. And then um, another short um, poem I'll read out word for word of Kipling's called When Earth's Last Picture is Painted and the tubes are twisted and dry, when the oldest colours have faded and the youngest critic has died, we shall rest and faith, we shall need it, lie down for an aeon or two till the master of all good workmen shall put us to work anew. And those that were good shall be happy, they shall sit in a golden chair, they shall splash at a ten league canvas with brushes of comet's hair. They shall find real saints to draw from. They shall work for an age at a sitting and never be tired at all. And only the master shall praise us and only the master shall blame and no one will work for the money and no one will work for the fame but each for the joy of the working and each in his separate star shall draw the thing as he sees it. The things as they really are. 